Welcome everybody to the ANU Energy Change Institute webinar today, uh, where we'll be examining the uh, government's technology investment roadmap. And uh, we have a, a group of panelists uh, with us today. I will uh, briefly go through uh, their names and backgrounds at the moment, and then I will be handing over to them each uh, to present their perspective on the roadmap. Uh, before we get into the uh, formal part of the uh, presentation, uh, let me now just uh, start by uh, acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet. And uh, we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so uh, as uh, you're all aware, uh, we are in the process of examining the discussion paper on the technology investment roadmap, which was released a couple of weeks ago. And as part of this process, the Energy Change Institute at the ANU has held this public forum where we have the opportunity to examine in some detail uh, the uh, ramifications of the technology roadmap uh, with a group of expert panelists. And of course, uh, this morning, many of you uh, will have participated in a webinar by the chief scientist, Dr. Alan Finkel, uh, in which he outlined the detailed thinking behind the roadmap and uh, also some of the elements of the discussion paper uh, that we'll be talking about today. So uh, we have uh, in the uh, panel discussion group uh, this morning, uh, Sophia Hamblin Wang. Sophia is the director of CO2 Value Australia, which is uh, an industry body promoting the development and deployment of sustainable industrial solutions that capture carbon dioxide and uh, transform it into useful products. Uh, then we have Dr. Patrick Hartley. Patrick is the leader of CSIRO's hydrogen industry mission. Uh, where he is responsible for developing the strategy, structure, operating model and partnerships that will underpin a major new national research initiative uh, based around uh, hydrogen and hydrogen industries. Uh, then we have Professor Frank Yotso. Uh, Frank is the Director of the Centre for Climate and Energy Policy at the ANU in the Crawford School of Public Policy. Uh, he's also a member of the Energy Change Institute here at ANU. And he's an economist uh, whose research focuses on policy for climate and energy. Then we have uh, Dr. Liz Ratnam, uh, who is also a member of the Energy Change Institute at ANU. Uh, she's a future engineering research leader uh, in the Research School of Electrical Energy and Materials Engineering. And she has an interest in uh, the control uh, of distribution networks and a focus on uh, resilience in a carbon neutral power grid. Uh, then we have Anna Scarbeck. Anna is the CEO of Climate Works Australia, uh, which is uh, located within the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. And uh, that uh, organization works to bridge the gap between research and climate action and accelerate the transition to zero emissions in Australia, Southeast Asia and the Pacific. And then finally, we have uh, Sanjeeva De Silva. Sanjeeva is the Acting General Manager of the Technology Roadmap Task Force, uh, which is uh, based in uh, the International Climate Change and Energy Innovation Division within the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. And Sanjeeva will be here to, uh, uh, to explain the processes and the mechanisms of the roadmap and to answer questions around the uh, uh, the, the, uh, the creation of the uh, discussion paper and the process for uh, the input of discussion into that document. So that's our group of panellists. Uh, and uh, what I'll be doing is to ask each of them to present their perspective on the roadmap uh, for around five minutes. Uh, uh, this will then be followed by the opportunity for you in the audience to ask the panel questions. Uh, and we will then uh, have a general panel discussion uh, around uh, the questions that you raise. 
Uh, but first of all, uh, let's hear from the panelists themselves, their perspective on the technology investment roadmap. And uh, I'd like to ask Sophia to start that discussion. Over to you, Sophia. Thank you for having me, Ken. And it's great to be here with so many people that I've seen on um, uh, on webinars very recently. Um, so thank you again for having me. I'm here representing uh, CO2 Value Australia, which is a industry policy and advocacy group for carbon capture and utilization technologies. Now, um, if you just want to go to the next slide. Um, the first thing I wanted to, sorry, just the next slide. Uh, the first thing I wanted to just tell everybody is that uh, titles matter and I wanted to get some of the nomenclature right from the start because carbon capture and utilization technologies are different from carbon capture and storage and also can be different to carbon capture utilization and storage so it's very um very inconsistent right now and it's something that we're trying to um get to the to get some consistency with. So um, carbon capture and storage is the underground injection of CO2 into cavities. Um, carbon capture and utilization is transforming CO2 into valuable materials that can be sold um, and yeah, can be used um, for money. And carbon capture, utilization and storage historically has been used uh, in some of our technology discussions as CCS plus enhanced oil recovery, um, but recently has been expanded in some places like um, the International Energy Agency and others to say that it is CCS plus CCU. So um, just if it's confusing for me, then it's definitely going to be confusing for everybody else. Um, for the purpose of this discussion, I'm talking about carbon capture and utilization, which is um, CO2 to usable materials. Next slide. Um, so um, our, our group CO2 Value Australia was formed uh, around a year ago, but after a lot of um, background work, um, to advocate for um, Australian companies and technologies that want to um, happen in Australia that transform CO2 into synthetic fuels, into building materials like cements, plasterboards and other aggregates, and also chemical feedstocks that can replace other hydrocarbon feedstocks. So um, the, the whole idea has come about because there are actually a lot of technologies in the world that use CO2 as a feedstock that maybe need a little bit of acceleration, which um, could uh, represent quite a lot of carbon abatement for the world. Um, and especially as we move towards 100% um, renewables and a net zero future, there will be a lot of um, heavy emitting industries that need decarbonisation pathways, so, um, like steel and cement and other chemical industries. So we're aligned with CO2 Value Europe, which is a think tank in Europe that has around 70 members in heavy industries signaling to the market that um, there is, um, there's movement here. Uh, next slide. And um, globally, we've seen that, um, yeah, the market has been estimated to be worth between 1.1 trillion and 5.9 trillion dollars globally and we we think that Australia could uh, play a really large part in that and final slide um, just given that processing CO2 into um, fuels and into um, building materials in particular um, would focus on using our advanced manufacturing um, our need to develop advanced manufacturing and use our bulk handling and resource processing competencies. It's actually um, an opportunity to develop a sustainability industry in Australia whilst using our existing competencies and also the ability to export um, green materials and help to decarbonize our, um, our partners and our, um, our neighbors. So um, our website is co2value.org.au and I'm looking forward to um, to talking more in this discussion about the roadmap. Terrific, thank you very much uh, Sophia. For those of you that uh, just joined us, I see a lot of people are coming on now. Uh, that was uh, Sophia Hamblin-Wang, 
uh, speaking on behalf of uh, the CO2 Value Australia peak body. Uh, my name is Ken Baldwin. I'm the director of the Energy Change Institute. I'm the uh, chair of the panel discussion today. And it's my pleasure now to uh, invite our next panelist, Dr. Patrick Hartley uh, from CSIRO's hydrogen industry mission uh, to give his perspective on the roadmap. Over to you, Patrick. Well, thanks very much, Ken, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope uh, I hope those of you who saw Dr. Finkel's presentation found it useful and interesting. I, I certainly did. Um, I guess in terms of the CSIRO view or my view on the technology investment roadmap, um, it's certainly clearly an important piece of work. Uh, I think the development of a long term strategic approach to developing and monitoring energy technology development investments uh, is it really important and, and particularly needs to be backed up by a robust evidence basis, which is really what I think the, uh, the, uh, the roadmap is all about. So uh, really, really applaud that, uh, that, uh, that direction that we're going in and, and really the, the need to use that information, both in terms of informing policy, which is of course the government focus here, but also really in providing a clear basis for industry investment, I think is, is particularly uh, critical. And, and we know the industry has been asking for for this in uh, in many different ways uh, in the energy the energy space, um, I think also really important to note that as as, as uh, Dr. Finkel said that it's a discussion paper at the moment, not the final document. Uh, so the, the lack of detail, which I think is probably pretty clear in the document at the moment and was, was commented on, is is, uh, is understandable from that context. It's really a, a discussion paper, which uh, which hopefully will start to uh, fill in some of those uh, those um, details uh, as as it moves forward. Um, CSIRO's role in, in developing uh, the, the roadmap, I mean, we are, we are involved. Uh, and uh, again, as, as Dr. Finkel mentioned, we, we, we've been reviewing quite a lot of the content uh, and, and perhaps significantly it draws from significant from pieces of work which we've developed in recent years, uh, including our recent Australian National Outlook report, uh, ongoing work on energy cost uh, um, development through our gen cost studies, uh, and the uh, low emissions technology roadmap, which we released in 2017. So there's, there's quite a bit of CSRO content and involvement in the process. Um, it's fair to say that the goals of the roadmap align closely with that of our energy business unit in CSRO, uh, which is to deliver trusted advice, world leading science and new technologies, which enable Australia's transition to a net zero emissions energy future. Uh, and really trying to focus that around solving that energy trilemma, which is which is touched on in the in the report, but not mentioned explicitly, of affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy systems. Additionally to that, I suppose the post COVID nineteen era is is an opportunity to really reframe that energy transition discussion and look at some of the new opportunities for the diversification of energy sources and supply. Uh, really, as an avenue now to look at the energy security and system resilience uh, questions, which. Uh, which are, uh, which are inherent in the energy transition. Uh, and, and also the potential for new industries which leverage those opportunities. And hydrogen is one which is obviously uh, one we're very interested in CSRO. Um, and we are investing significantly in this area uh, in, in terms of research and technology development, both through our hydrogen energy systems future science platform, which really focuses on the early stage research, uh, which can help that industry develop. Uh, and more recently, the proposal which, uh, which I'm working on to establish a hydrogen industry mission, which really delivers in partnerships, industry enabling R&D in support of uh, market activation for hydrogen uh, and really to support that H2 under two stretch goal, which we saw in the, uh, the investment roadmap. Uh, we see that goal as, I guess, uh, uh, ambitious, uh, but appropriate. Uh, our, our national hydrogen roadmap, which we published in 2018, uh, Saw, saw two dollars fifty as a as a as a best case but achievable goal, uh, so not too far away from the H two under two, I guess, in terms of uh, in terms of what the future might look like. So uh, yeah, pretty pretty comfortable with that uh, that uh, general target uh, as something as as a cost for hydrogen that really allows a whole lot of different industry applications to come online. So um, yeah, I might uh, I might just leave it there and uh, and hand back to you, Ken. Terrific. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, Patrick Hartley from CSIRO's uh, hydrogen mission, uh, providing his perspective on the roadmap. Uh, it's now my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, my ANU colleague, uh, Professor Frank Yotso, uh, to give uh, perspective uh, from his uh, viewpoint. Thank you there, Frank. Um, okay, just a few points here. So, um, 
overall a very positive development actually to have a process, a formal process of defining priorities um, towards a new energy system and, and a lower carbon uh, overall economic system um, with, uh, with a method and a framework here for, for input from, from stakeholders and now I think we can be sure that the research community overall, including universities, will engage quite wholesomely in this, this, this ample capacity to provide good analysis on technology, on economics, and also the broader strategic perspectives that invariably come up when you think long term about a transition like that. Um, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a framework for an annual review of technology priorities. Um, I think that's really quite splendid. That can be a lasting framework, institutional framework um, to, to guiding uh, this kind of effort uh, in Australia. It's also clear that this roadmap is to flow into a, a national long-term strategy on lower emissions outcomes, which, which the country is required to submit under the UN Paris Agreement. Um, and, uh, and we engaged in, in research that will be relevant to that long-term emission strategy. So if you're interested in that, uh, please, please do get in touch and stay in touch of the remainder of the year. So in terms of technology, obviously a very long list of technology, everything under the sun is really mentioned in that discussion paper. That has attracted a lot of criticism, but you know, it's a discussion paper and I think it's actually a very good starting point. Uh, to have kind of everything on, on the table. Notably, that everything does not include coal. And so, to me, that's actually one of the most significant aspects of the discussion paper um, that, you know, implicitly it, it takes uh, coal off, off the table, I think, as, as a future technology for Australia's energy system. A um, lot of mention of carbon capture and storage. Um, uh, also, yeah, often some misunderstanding public commentary around that because, you know, what's suggested is that CCS for industry, not for the power sector. And that is absolutely the, the right approach, CCS and CCU, carbon capture and use for in, in industrial applications. Um, mention of gas as a, as, as a component of all of this, very clearly part of a broader push by the federal government for expansion of gas production. Um, and I think most importantly, really, from a long-term perspective, um, is that all of the renewable energy technologies and renewable enabling technologies, um, including um, uh, you know, the potential for a renewables-based energy export and energy intensive products export industry from Australia, are in the discussion paper for the roadmap. So how to whittle down over 100 technologies to just a handful? I think Dr. Finkel said he wants a handful uh, in that priority list. Um, so a lot of interests that will come together on that. And the question is really, you know, what is to be decided, what is to be done, and what is to be funded really on the basis of such a priority list? Um, obviously R&D, um, the question then is what are the areas where Australia, right, with relative limited uh, resourcing can really make a difference here relative to a global research effort, right, um, and where are the best economic returns um, for, for investment, uh, very central in that consideration. Um, and then we come to the question of funding and that comes to a question of deployment as well. So. Um, in terms of, you know, if you really want to make um, progress here um, in an area that is really of quite central national importance of economic importance decades to come, then, you know, those, the, any funding commitment needs to be measured in billions, not, not millions. Um, it, it seems that ARENA might get new programs, right? Uh, one would hope that it will be well resourced if that is the case. Clean Energy Finance Corporation is an obvious vehicle to use. And again, that's, that's mentioned in a discussion paper. Um, to my mind, if the CFC investment mandate is to be broadened and broadened a lot probably, uh, then its endowment should be increased. Uh, CFC makes a return for the government. Um, and, uh, and in these times of economic recession, it actually makes perfect sense for government to invest more, for government to help drive commercial investment and, and to stimulate the economy. And in that context, uh, allow me to point out that we have published today a working paper on low carbon stimulus or 
fiscal stimulus compatible with low carbon uh, objectives. And I'd, I'd warmly welcome uh, any comment and reaction to that paper that we published today there on fiscal stimulus that's compatible with low, low carbon objectives as well as economic and social outcomes. Finally, and I'll end on that, uh, deployment. So uh, Minister Taylor has been clear that it's all about technology, not taxes. Uh, implicit here is that uh, deployment will have to wait until uh, clean energy or new technology is at cost parity with existing old technologies or high, high emitting technologies. Um, the thing is, of course, experience tells us that um, many technologies uh, need support um, in the period uh, where, uh, where they become cost competitive until they can be deployed at scale. So that can be through co-financing, through subsidies of various forms, uh, through, they are mentioned, carbon pricing, uh, maybe regulation for minimum standards, right? And cost parity comes later. So the tremendous success story of solar photovoltaics tells us this story. There was, you know, I mean, this is, this is now cost, uh, cost, um, cost competitive, but it wasn't during an extended period of, of development uh, and deployment. Uh, and for some technologies, you know, they will never be at cost parity with their polluting um, alternatives. Uh, anything with carbon capture and storage is really in that basket. And so in these cases, the social benefit uh, of zero carbon production structures and the future advantage in global markets needs to be taken into account uh, when setting policy. Thanks very much. Terrific, thank you, Frank. Uh, so now I'd like to pass over to uh, another ANU colleague from the Energy Change Institute, Liz Ratnam. Uh, Liz, uh, let's hear your perspective on the technology investment roadmap. And for those of you in the audience, uh, if you would like to start thinking about what questions you might like to ask at the end of the panel discussion, please go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and pose questions there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ken. I have some slides as well. Um, are you able to, to share them, Paris, or sh shall I? Wonderful. So we'll, we'll maybe progress to the next slide. Um, this is just showing everyone um, the roadmap and how it looks. So the next slide, um, I'll be touching on stage um, three and stage four. So. Um, the, the stages six to um, onwards are, are, are going to evolve, I suppose, after the submission. Um, so maybe we'll pro progress to the next stage where we're looking at um, the short, medium and long term. So in the short term in particular, my um, area and interest is in electricity and um, how, to, how to make it affordable, secure and reliable um, as the roadmap um, mapped out. And in particular, um, looking at things like residential rooftop solar and battery storage. So maybe if we progress to the next slide, um, looking at this short term, um, so from 2020 to 2022, um, as Frank um, said, we, we've had um, a large success with rooftop solar, um, where if we look at a, a, a typical residential customer that consumes approximately 20 kilowatt hours a day, um, that cost them approximately $5 a day. If that customer installed rooftop solar in a really small unit, a one and a half kilowatt unit, they produce approximately five kilowatt hours a day of the 20. And that can um, lead to a reduction in their bill of um, to approximately $3 a day, depending on what your financial um, tariffs are. For example, net meeting, feed-in tariff, there, there's a, a variety of different ways to do it. And so we've seen a lot of success because of um, one, reducing emissions and two, for the customers, um, saving money on their electricity. And so more recently, we've seen um, battery storage reduce considerably in cost. Um, so through my research, uh, when I started, um, the battery cost for lithium ion, for example, was you know, upwards of $800 per, per kilowatt hour. Um, and now it's like, you know, projected to come down um, considerably more. And so the payback period, we're looking at like, you know, seven to 10 years. But um, if we install that battery storage with um, the solar PV, and particularly in Australia, where we have time of use tariffs that allow us to save the electricity um, that's produced in the daytime and then use that electricity when we come home and use a lot of our power, 
um, if we just looked at the financial way of like charging and discharging that battery, um, you know, there, there's their opportunity to actually be paid by the utility depending on your tariff um, of how you do that. However, if everyone goes, uh, um, goes and does the same thing, like uses the same tariff, charges and discharges the battery at the same time, and we had like everyone installing the technology, we potentially um, create new, new challenges for the grid in that the problem that we had with solar in the middle of the day, um, generating a lot of power, but nobody using it because they're at um, work, then gets shifted to the, the peak pricing time. So some of my work has looked at how do you balance um, reducing the, the cost to expanding the electrical infrastructure to facilitate this technology um, versus like looking at the financial benefits to the customer. And so um, where you see this QP is a, a different control framework. Um, if we looked at um, how to balance those objectives um, using today's tariffs, we could actually um, you know, reduce the cost of expansion for the grid, help the customer and reduce their bills an extra $2 a day, which is um, you know, really, I think what this short term framework should be about is like, how do we, we um, incentivize um, these different technologies um, so that they also help the utility as well as the customer. And so if you go to the next slide, um, thinking um, more longer term out to the medium, so 2023 to 2030 on the roadmap, um, where we talk about dispatchable generation, storage, transmission, and support for electrification of other um, sectors, what's really interesting is um, if we go to the next slide, the AEMO, um, um, integrated system plan. So um, if you go through the, the system plan on the, the right side here, this, this graph, um, the highlighted region is this 2023 to 2030. Um, and um, on the other side of the axis, we see the, the retiring of coal-fired um, generation. Um, so we see Liddell happening in the next two or three years, but then we've got like a bit of a window in this period to really prepare for this rapid um, decommissioning of existing infrastructure. So this is really our window to prepare um, for this, this change in generation mixes. Um, and so what I sort of see in this medium term is that we need to um, also address another challenge of the electrification of other industries. So for example, electric vehicles, if you, um, you know, drive considerably if you think about um, 10 kilowatt hours a day that you might need to charge up to 20. It's almost on par with what that 20 kilowatt hours a day was for a single residential customer consuming. So it's quite an, a, a large draw on the existing infrastructure to support that electrification, particularly at that residential level. And so um, we've got this opportunity to prepare for this decommissioning, but we also have um, this, this um, opportunity to, to look at how do we um, leverage these new devices. So an electric vehicle could also could help the grid in, in supporting it during um, times that we needed electricity with, with storage. So um, we've got this extra load, but we also have this extra flexibility. So how do we coordinate um, all of these devices like rooftop solar, um, wind, battery, backing this renewable energy and also electric vehicles. So that's like on the technology side, which I think the roadmap addresses really well. Um, um, however, I, I kind of seen like um, what enables all of this technology and our, our ability to move forward is um, the, the supporting technologies of control and coordination and sensing. Um, so if you can't see the problems, you can't, um, it's hard to address them, for example. And traditionally in the distribution sector, um, we've had very limited sensing. So um, in the past, we've relied a lot on customers calling and letting us know when there's problems in the grid and then doing an investigation. That's starting to change, but to facilitate you know, millions of devices um, to, to allow for um, these coal-fired generators to, to be decommissioned um, is really going to require a lot in terms of the sensing and control and coordination. So we move to the next slide um, in terms of long-term. I really see that as like us getting prepared for this 
rapid um, decommissioning of coal power generators. And in there, they've talked about growing capacity. So, you know, if you think of that 20 kilowatt hours a day for one customer and adding like almost doubling that for electric vehicles and other electrification, um, we're going to need more capacity in addition to the capacity that we're going to require to decommission these um, existing infrastructure. So um, capacity um, growth, like I see the medium term is our opportunity to get it right. And then we're going to expand. I think I've got one last one or two last slides. How am I going for time? Um, so um, longer term um, decommissioning um, those generators. And then the next slide, if we move on. Yes, my indicative shot list. So it was really interesting um, to look at this and just, I suppose the, the key message I want to convey is, um, of course, we need to invest in the technologies um, and, and to, to bring down the cost to enable the adaption, but equally um, supporting those technologies. So, um, for example, grid security technologies, um, microgrids, um, simulator technologies, these are all going to support these renewable um, technologies deployment and, and to get to this kind of scale that we need to go. And a few red things thing <laughs> highlighted there, like grid sensors and flywheels, I, I think um, we're missing from the roadmap. And so the last slide, I think we progress. Yes, um, um, I agree with, with this slide, except for in the red text here, I probably add not on track to use the control and coordination and the cyber resilience. So that's what we're, we're doing a lot of work in the research sector to, to, um, to facilitate this um, transition. Um, however, we need to have the sensors and the data and, and um, stable control systems in place to, to facilitate this this path forward. So thank you. I think that's my last slide. I'll hand it back. Great. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, so now we'll move on to uh, welcome Anna Skarbek uh, from ClimateWorks and uh, Anna will give us her perspective on the technology investment roadmap. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, Ken. Hopefully I'm unmuted now. So uh, I'm very supportive of all that's been said so far um, and with the opportunity to follow in the other speakers, I, I won't repeat uh, those messages, but rather dig deeper on a couple of those areas, particularly around uh, what does supporting deployment of these technologies look like and, uh, and, and how might we consider grouping the long list of technologies into, say, the, the top half dozen that... Um, uh, that Alan Finkel and others have called for. So uh, to open, of course, um, ClimateWorks Australia has uh, recently published a detailed study of uh, the decarbonisation technologies that are available in Australia. That's our research series, Decarbonisation Futures, which builds on work that we did with ANU five years ago with Frank, who's with us today. And that's available on our website and um, I won't go through that today, but to say that all of the technologies in the scenarios that we study are included in the government technology investment roadmap. What that work showed is that the technologies are available and in many cases mature or already demonstrated and what's needed is to accelerate their deployment and that it's the pace of deployment and scale is the, is the acceleration that we need. Um, I'm pleased to note that the Technology Investment Roadmap itself acknowledges this and in particular also acknowledges the breadth of the sectors uh, where these technologies need to be deployed. And so in relation in particular to sectors outside of electricity, the paper acknowledges that challenges to deployment of cost-saving technologies across the built environment, transport, industry and agriculture is a priority. And so we have used a similar framework to uh, the slide that um, was just shown there from the IEA, looking across the sectors where these technologies can be deployed, those, those, those sectors, buildings, industry, transport, agriculture and electricity. Across all of those sectors, we see that the technologies can be grouped into broadly four pillars of decarbonisation. And this matters for the prioritisation because the research shows that we need all of these, that it isn't about one 
uh, picking, picking, picking a few that will do the whole job. Those four pillars are energy efficiency and demand management, electricity, obviously, zero emissions electricity through renewables, and fuel switch. So that's electrification and also switching to um, biofuels, renewable hydrogen as a substitute for gas and uh, all other fuel switch opportunities in the non-electrified uh, energy sources. And then the fourth are the non-energy emissions for which largely the opportunities are sequestration or substitution. And again, uh, there's a range of technologies uh, that are needed. And all of those four pillars apply across all the five sectors. So a key message when thinking about this task is, is to think about grouping the challenges into priorities rather than perhaps the individual technologies and looking at how those technologies work together to address each of the pillars of those challenges. So when ClimateWorks has looked at how do we support the deployment of this breadth of technologies, we um, are encouraged by uh, the successful history of combination of push-pull measures, and that's where the initial upfront investment considered, say, the push, which is the focus of this technology investment roadmap, where might government investment do its job, is combined with the pull measures that really send the signal that there is a long-term market or an ongoing buyer of the technology that the, the push signal can, can support some initial cost reduction. And so we've seen in, in the clean energy sector that has worked well, for example, when we had the, the, the RET initially was a, was a buying signal that was set at what was thought to be 2% of the market, it was actually a, a specified number of megawatt hours. And then that, as the market grew, that goal grew to 20% and, and stood there as a confirmed buyer of that share of electricity. On top of that, there was then government investment through ARENA and CSC that combined to provide upfront grants and concessional debt. And, and those two organisations stood in the market also as a funder of, the, of 10 large scale solar farms through a coordinated round, which, which over 18 months saw the cost per megawatt halved. But there were more bidders than winners to that, to that 10 round farm, um, uh, program because there was the long-term market signal uh, that, the, that the RET and the, and the state reverse options by that point provided. So we will be keen to see how that combination of push-pull measures can be applied to all the other priority technologies that this technology investment roadmap is exploring, such as renewable hydrogen, such as demand management energy efficiency in the built environment, such as the transport measures. Uh, electrification of vehicles. So the Technology Investment Roadmap uh, focuses on economic stretch goals. We've heard about the H2 under two, and they are a really helpful endpoint goal, which, which, which we consider can be paired with what we would call usage stretch goals. And the deployment then comes into the frame as what as the, as the actions that government and, and corporate buyers can support. So if we think about the economic stretch goal is ultimately the price point at which we would see universal usage when it's, when it's competitive for the market to be deploying it widespread. These deployment stretch goals help us set the interim steps along the way. What can procurement do when, when government can partner as an investor but also as a buyer um, or through policy to require that the market be the buyer? So for example, in transport, we're seeing state governments are buying uh, electric buses. Um, but we also know from our research what the, what the usage stretch targets are that align with the carbon trajectories of the Paris Agreement to set us um, on a path of two degrees or one and a half. So in the, in the renewable electricity sector, we know that that requires renewables to reach three quarters, so 75% or more of the grid this decade and AEMO confirms that's possible. And for transport, we know that electric vehicles would ideally reach uh, about 75% of all new vehicles sold by the end of this decade to stay in line with a one and a half degree uh, trajectory. So that's a usage stretch target. It equates to about a third of the fleet within a decade. Interestingly, five years ago, the research showed that maybe EVs would take three decades to reach one third of fleet deployment. So the technology improvement has been rapid in the last five years and, and 
And we consider that these usage stretch goals are a really important pairing of, um, of policy and buying commitment to help achieve the economic stretch goals. I support also Frank's analysis that fiscal stimulus measures are a great opportunity to align the double dividend of decarbonisation and economic revitalisation um, and happy to, um, to join the conversation on that afterwards. There are other examples where those usage stretch goals have played a big role. For example, in the built environment, governments acted as the first buyer of four and a half star commercial office, office buildings. And that then helped catalyse the whole market, not just for those initial government tenanted offices, but now it normalised that now nearly all commercial offices will build at a four and a half star or five star so that they can attract that sort of government tenant. That I hope is an illustration of the power of the push-pull signals. Um, and we're looking forward to working with um, this community and the government in the development of what measures can follow the prioritisation that the Technology Investment Roadmap has catalyzed. Thank you. Terrific, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, now I'd like to bring in our final panellist, uh, Sanjeeva De Silva. So Sanjeeva is the Acting General Manager of the Technology Roadmap Task Force. Uh, so uh, he will uh, present uh, some slides which tell us uh, a bit more about the process of how the roadmap uh, will be developed and evolved over time. So uh, welcome to Sanjeeva. Thanks very much, Ken. And um, I missed the very beginning of this, uh, the webinar. You may have already acknowledged country, but just to, just to begin by saying that in the spirit of reconciliation, I and the Department of Industry acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting across Australia, their connections to the land, sea and community, and we respect their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are on the webinar today. So having said that, let me begin by, um, I do have some slides, but not absolutely necessary to put them up. Uh, so thanks Ken for inviting me to speak. I think um, I was surprised a number of the panelists have already done a lot of my job for me um, by highlighting the sort of things that I wanted to stress at the beginning of this discussion. If we can move to the next, uh, next slide. So the person that put these slides together for me, um, they've actually made it animated. So if you could just track, uh, track it through so that we have the whole screen full Paris, that'd be great. So back in August, when Minister Taylor asked us to start working on this project, a couple of things were really apparent from the very beginning. Uh, the first was that deploying uh, low emissions technology was not going to be um, something that the government could do alone. That sounds sort of obvious, but a partnership with industry, with communities, uh, and with the private sector and investors in particular, that partnership was gonna be crucial to our success or failure. And the second thing was that in this space, technology is moving so quickly, this couldn't be a set and forget. We couldn't just have a technology roadmap that we published and, and, and hoped that that would somehow chart us on the way towards 2050. So there are two characteristics that um, a couple of the speakers have outlined and that Dr. Finkel has outlined throughout the, uh, throughout the workshops that we've been doing, but it's worth repeating. This document that we released uh, in, on the 21st of May, that is not the roadmap, that is just a discussion paper. And I know we've included a fair bit of detail for a, uh, for a discussion paper, but we wanted to do that to get the kind of engagement that we're actually seeing. So um, the first point to make, this is a discussion paper, the roadmap is the process and the ongoing annual statements that will come. And the second aspect of it is to just get at that fact that we now have a platform whereby Australians can come together and have this discussion on an annual basis, which um, from my, from my uh, thinking is probably the most valuable thing that we've achieved with that discussion paper. So. Um, just to say, uh, Dr. Finkel and, and I have been involved now um, over the last week with around seven or eight workshops. All of them have been oversubscribed um, and the level of engagement has been um, fantastic. Both incredibly well informed, teaching the task force and others in our, uh, our team, you know, things that we, we um, we're seeing new perspectives on how we would 
approach this work. So all of it has been fantastic. And so what we're saying is that this discussion needs to continue. And the take home message, I guess, from my presentation will be that on the 21st of June, we'd hope that people can put into writing their submissions into this roadmap process because the task force will look at them very carefully um, as we head along. We did, just on that, we did lose a couple of months uh, in terms of the release of the roadmap because of the COVID pandemic. And, and what I would encourage people to try and do is to try and meet that 21st deadline only because uh, we will have a lot of submissions and working through them will be um, you know, tough if, if things are coming uh, uh, far past that. But of course, we wanna hear from everyone in terms of this process. Um, can you click through all of the other, the rest of the animation there? Thanks, Paris. Now, this um, is a variation of the slide that was put up earlier that comes from the roadmap, but it just is, it, it's kind of a bit clearer on what stage we're at and what this first low emissions technology statement that will be released later this year, what that first statement is going to really focus on. The discussion paper set a vision, and uh, you can read that vision. It's, it's maybe not as punchy as uh, some people uh, would have hoped for, but I can tell you that the central platform of that vision is that Australia takes a leadership role, or you know, we are already a leader in many of these areas, but that Australia takes a leadership role into the future, domestically and internationally, on the deployment of low emissions technologies. That's really the, the core part of the vision of this roadmap. Um, after setting a vision, we pulled together a few, um, a few people from across our department, uh, from across the public service, but also we had excellent engagement from ARENA in sp particularly um, to do a survey, an initial survey of about 140 technologies um, uh, that, were, that were important. CSIRO, our colleagues at CSIRO kicked the tires on that uh, review and the output of that review is presented in the discussion paper. We will have missed technologies in that. Also, our assessments may be um, maybe more ambitious or less ambitious that in relation to particular technologies than people on this call might have liked. This was the whole um, opportunity and please write in and let us know where we've slipped up. We want to hear from you on, on those things. Um, a key thing about that survey is the fact that we approached this process by going very broad, very broad, ignoring some of the political, social dimensions to some of those technologies we went broad because we did want to make sure that everything was in our field of vision as we get towards our priority setting. The second thing, and I was really happy to hear Anna say this, um, uh, say this point, which is that before you prioritize the actual technologies, which of course will change over time and evolve, before you set those technologies, in the near, medium, and long term, you need to be clear about what are the challenges and opportunities you're going to pursue. Now, we pitched our initial thinking on that in, to, in the roadmap, in the discussion paper, but we are really welcoming people uh, to come to the conversation and let us know what you think Australia as a country needs to uh, prioritise in the near, medium, and long term in terms of the challenges and opportunities we, we pursue through technology. Um, now, in terms of the first, uh, the, the first statement, there are going to be two really critical things that it will do. It isn't going to um, just stop as the discussion paper did with just a broad survey. It is going to identify priority technologies. And there are two basic components to how we see that happening. First, there's the technical analysis that we're doing. But second, we have a panel led by Dr. Finkel, but including um, people that, you know, it's just a, a pleasure for me personally to be working with, um, you know, leaders from across industry and across um, uh, the Australian private sector as well as uh, government who are helping us do the much more difficult task of uh, sort of judging where we lay our priorities, what challenges and opportunities we pursue. So that's the identification of technologies. And finally, just to say that Minister Taylor core to his thinking is that while we recognize there are various issues that factor into uh, the deployment of technologies, we fully, uh, he, he fully accepts that, the first order task is to understand 
when those low emission technologies um, come into economic parity with their competing business as usual counterparts. And that is the core of what we are calling these economic stretch goals. And so that, that will frame a lot of the thinking around how we approach that statement. After the statement, there will be a continuing process and go round and round and we will revisit it each year. After the process, we want to make sure that this is also an opportunity for the government to step back and balance its portfolio, look across its investments in clean or low emissions technology and say, this balanced portfolio, the portfolio balance we have is appropriate to where we want to head. And the balancing points in particular where we're looking at there are, you know, have we spread our risk appropriately? Have we looked at, um, uh, you know, investments in um, mature technologies that will ensure deployment in the near and medium term? But have we also set up the research and the basic R&D that we need to ensure that in 2050, Australians are ready to contribute to solving the big problems we see, um, that the big challenges we see uh, out, 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 out to that um, extent. Of course, we then have to deliver our investments and we are also gonna bring a heavy emphasis into impact evaluation, really tracking how is our investment performing against the goals that we've outlined. Now, Ken, I think I'm probably out of time, so I might just quickly just look at the next slide and say the key thing the key thing to recognize in terms of the character of this process and the statement, the next slide, um, Paris, thanks. And if we could just track through that. The key thing here is that this is not a um, panel. The panel, uh, the ministerial reference panel will not be presenting a separate report which recommends various actions by government, which then the minister either accepts or not, it doesn't. The statement that will result at the end of this year, which the task force will support the drafting of, but Minister Taylor will, will own, will be owned by the government. And so it will be a document that outlines how the government will track. Um, the ministerial reference panel is guiding us at every step along that um, drafting process. And you know, I'm really grateful that Dr. Finkel has um, given up a huge amount of his time, even in the last couple of weeks, but um, going back months now to guide us in that process. Uh, obviously, we are talking to industry and communities and what we what we will come out with is, is, is this, this um, low emissions technology statement later in the year. I'm, I'm really happy to answer questions, but I might just leave it there for now. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much, Sanjeeva. And uh, we uh, now have had a chance to hear from all our panellists uh, on their perspective. Um, I would uh, like to encourage uh, those of you that are listening into the webinar to now uh, put uh, your questions on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we have quite a few already and, uh, and we'll go through them in the next half hour or so. Um, I'd like to kick this uh, Q&A session off uh, with a couple of questions myself of the panel. Um, the first of these, I will uh, like, I would be interested to hear your perspective on what should be the stretch goals uh, that we've heard about uh, in the discussion paper and that uh, Sanjeev just mentioned. So from your perspective, uh, what are the big technology goals that Australia can really contribute to? Uh, on the technology roadmap uh, over time. Uh, so let's think about that. But my first question is around uh, the, the process of filtering these technologies. And uh, we saw the chief scientist this morning uh, show a slide which had uh, a number of filters uh, progressing uh, through the technology roadmap process, uh, starting with the capacity to create large abatement, uh, the capacity to provide economic value, uh, the technology readiness, et cetera, et cetera. So these filters are applied successively as uh, the roadmap progresses and, of course, reduces the number of technologies uh, that are being prioritised down to a smaller list. So my question is, that's fair enough. You're putting this in terms of the, of the overall objectives of the, of the scheme. Uh, but how do we avoid uh, technology lock-in, particularly at an early stage in this sort of process, or even technology lock-out for something that might suddenly develop 
uh, more prospectively in coming years than was thought initially and could be allowed back into the, into the investment uh, process. So I'd uh, be interested to hear the panel's views on, uh, on ways in which we can make sure that lock-in and lock-out uh, doesn't happen uh, to the exclusion or the uh, uh, inclusion of technologies over time. Who'd like to go first on that? I can jump in on that, Ken. I think uh, just some lessons perhaps from hydrogen industry development and that national hydrogen strategy, which was uh, which was adopted last year, late last year. I think the, one of the key the key uh, um, desires from that uh, that strategy is really to have uh, a very adaptive approach to, uh, to to technology choices and uh, and recognise that you know I think the key point here is this 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 process of review review measure. Uh, and uh, and and decide again and keep doing that. I think it's it's really important not to lock in things for a long long term, that as you say might uh, might suddenly be supplanted by a uh, by a disruptive innovation or or other uh, other factors. So it's challenging because some of these things require huge capex investments, uh, and and you know the organisations that want to want the industries that want to do that will need the certainty around that. So it is a bit of a double edged sword, but. Certainly, remaining adaptive, I think, is a key a key part of that. Thanks, Patrick. Thank Anybody you. else? Frank. Oh, yeah. I mean, it it would seem that the process that maps that's mapped out in the discussion paper allows for adjustment, right, of of priorities over time. Um, and you know, I mean, it's inescapable that uh, if you uh, if you intend to provide support for specific technologies, then then they need to be chosen. Application of criteria such as abatement potential uh, is important. You'd obviously want some sort of notion of cost effectiveness in that, um, and a notion of the um, the probability or possibility of emerging. Um, advantage, comparative advantage in different technologies, right? Um, you'd, you'd want to think about it in those terms. I'd, I'd agree and I'd, oh sorry, Elizabeth, did you want to go? Um, so just, I'm keeping it as adaptable and flexible as possible is very important, but obviously the shape of a funnel is, would indicate that we would be wanting to make sure that as many technologies as possible are considered at the beginning. And so that's why this discussion paper and responses to the discussion are going to be super important because if anything's been forgotten at this stage, it needs to be um, included. And then there needs to be um, some mechanism to bring in new disruptive technologies down the track if they're necessary. Thanks. So I agree. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, so I was just going to add that I think um, it's really important to fund on multiple timelines. So, for example, um, when I started work on battery storage, it was um, during the Smart Grid Smart City Ausgrid trial. And at that point in time, it was not cost effective. However, I started to ask the question, like, when does it become cost effective? And now you know, more than um, 10 years later, um, we're starting to see that technology um, being quite disruptive. And so I, I would see it's quite important to, to fund both research that might not be cost effective, like considered in the short or medium term, but then to like bring that forward at some later stage where things become adaptive. So, so having multiple horizons of research, um, long-term strategic and short-term and being able to shift them around, I think is, is quite important. Could I add my, um, so just to uh, really support, I mean, Alan also brings that idea of a, um, an adaptive approach, you know, through the hydrogen strategy into our thinking now. Um, you know, there are certain things you can invest in that are going to support you no matter how things develop. One of the, the classic one is where you invest in skills, you know, and, and capability that supports you um, however the future state of the world develops. Um, one one also on that point uh, that uh, of the time horizons, one thing that the roadmap explicitly recognizes is that with our current investments, we need to see impacts in the near term, the medium term and the long term. So those impacts need to be weighted and balanced accordingly. So that the structure that I described has specifically been uh, created for that. The last point I would make, Ken, is just that the minister has emphasized the importance of us getting better at also cutting ending funding where things are not delivering 
the results that we would have seen, we wanted to see. So that's, that's probably one of the most difficult things about technology investment. May I just add one more thing? Sure. Um, just in, in terms of the roadmap is meant to be technology neutral. So one thing that we should be considering as well is that um, we don't want just the loudest mouths to be getting fed. We need to be making sure that um, we, we give equal voice to a lot of different technologies and not just be backing one winner. A portfolio of winners would be ideal. Good, okay. Well, thank you panelists for, for those thoughts on, uh, on lock-in and lock-out. Um, have in the back of your mind uh, what your stretch goal contribution might be for the very end. Um, but we'll now move to some questions from the audience. So uh, we have a question here from uh, Juventus uh, talking about um, the fact that, um, you know, that there, there are issues even as we speak about uh, grid stability. And uh, we've seen, for example, uh, the uh, the effect of, uh, of, 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 um, of the lack of transmission in some areas uh, where there was curtailment of, uh, of solar uh, in uh, parts of uh, the West Murray region uh, due to grid overload. So aren't we already needing um, uh, investments in technology in the sort of underpinning uh, of these uh, of these energy uh, areas, and uh, this was a question that was directed at Liz. But I'd be interested to hear the other panelists' views on that. It's curtailing um, in the large transmission because of limitations in the grid um, is not particular to just that part of the grid. It, it happens um, around, um, like from the customer end all the way up, right? So if for example, there's um, a lot of solar and everyone on your street has solar panels and the grid hasn't been expanded to facilitate that solar, the, um, the voltage will potentially rise to a point where your inverter will switch off. And so it's been curtailed um, in that way. So really backing these renewables with storage or technologies um, that can shift this energy around is quite key um, in terms of, um, you know, leveraging the, the, the renewables that we have and decarbonizing. So, you know, ha th there's a lot of work that has to be done in terms of control and coordination for grid stability. Um, and also how do we like, you know, coordinate these devices so that supply and demand um, is balanced. So let's now move on to another question. Uh, so uh, one of the audience has pointed out that um, already there are uh, uh, financial reasons why people are moving away from gas uh, at the domestic level at least and uh, and indeed many industrial processes uh, that are being transformed and electrified. Um, so they're asking are we perhaps headed uh, for a, a gas network death spiral and the supplementary question to that is uh, should we be considering moving away from gas entirely rather than distributing hydrogen with this infrastructure? Well, if, if I may briefly, um, I put it on Twitter the other day, we, we disconnected gas in, in my house and you will see that really <clears throat> as, a, as a bit of a wave in future. And so there's a big question mark, I think, over the viability uh, of, of um, constructing and maintaining in the long term gas distribution networks to households. Um, it's probably an altogether different story in terms of business, uh, commercial and industrial applications where you'll probably see gas uh, being used for quite some time to come. Yeah, I think I can, I can jump in there too. I think, you know, you're seeing in, in the hydrogen industry side of things, you're seeing, you know, people like Ben Wilson, who, who, who's involved in this work, um, his, his organisation, uh, Australian Gas Industry Group, are really looking hard at hydrogen and actually really, really driving a lot of those demonstration projects in that space now across Australia. Uh, and so I think they're recognising that that, uh, that 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 their infrastructure is, you know, has a uh, has a, a, a different future. Uh, um, but I don't I don't I think I think I think as, as we just heard there, there are multiple gas industries. Some things like industrial heating, um, again, hydrogen can play a role, but it could be a longer term uh, proposition. So there's more than one answer to this this uh, question. I think. Good. Thank you, Patrick. So uh, there's a, a question here that I actually remember hearing uh, being asked to the chair scientists this morning uh, and uh, so I think you know this deserves maybe a bit more airtime. Um, 
The question is from, uh, from Freya, uh, is there any focus on increased efficiency to minimise demand on energy wherever possible? Uh, what kind of prioritisation does efficiency have in the roadmap? Uh, so this is a question that relates, um, you know, more to the demand side than the supply side, where technology clearly is often focused on the supply side. So it'd be interesting to hear from the panellists where they see the, the role of technology on the demand side of things uh, being a significant contributor. I'm happy to start with this one. Um, and uh, our research shows the demand side is an extremely significant contributor in nearly all sectors. And indeed, at one of the consultation sessions that Alan Finkel ran for the industry sector, uh, it was pointed out there that, um, that many of the call out boxes in the document uh, the discussion paper focus on the supply side technologies and, and would there be an opportunity for similar focus on demand side technologies and of course Alan Finkel's response was it's a consultation paper if that's your view then use this process to share that view um, so I certainly um, uh, endorse the encouragement for the demand management sector to, um, to, to make that more evident and indeed there's been some new CRCs recently that, that have that focus. On the opportunity for Australia to have a competitive advantage also, um, we have a, a, a double dividend potential here. Not only does the demand side potential allow, obviously, cost savings uh, for the energy users, but we do have um, technological advantage opportunities. Um, already, because of the nature of our, our grid, the combination of distributed energy resources, demand management, grid integration, and the digitisation and business model evolution is an innovation space that many international investors are looking to Australia as an exciting and fast moving um, test bed and therefore launch, pa launch pad uh, for, those, for that sector. The other opportunity, of course, um, the state where I'm from, Victoria, has a universal rollout of smart meters, which enables uh, more sophisticated demand management uh, technologies. And again, there is an opportunity for a competitive advantage um, positioning for Australia. So we have both the technological wherewithal, uh, the financial benefit, and finally, the emission benefit is substantial, um, and that links to the cost as well. So um, our research shows that um, on the path to decarbonising the built environment, energy use per square metre in buildings can halve. And in fact, we can maintain electricity use for the built environment at level while the building stock doubles. But that's only if the demand management uh, technologies play their part. And that goes to deployment and business model rollout for what, it, what, what can be thousands of, thousands of transactions of, of small equipment upgrades. Fortunately, that's quite stimulus friendly. So I'm hopeful that at the moment the, the stars would align um, and that we can indeed craft the support measures to bring forward that. And we know on the demand management side, it's very relevant for industry as well. There's been a lot of work done on, um, on, on the use of gas, yeah, particularly for um, upgrading boilers, economisers, um, and the opportunity for electrification and heat pumps. So the, the efficiency and in industrial modernisation is another opportunity that aligns with stimulus investment, economic recovery, and bringing in the demand management focus to industry, as well as built environment, um, and of course, the electricity grid with the recent development yesterday from the AEMC as well to formally create a market for that. I do, I do believe it will, will and should play a prominent role in the um, technology prioritisation. Good, thanks, Anna. Anybody else like to contribute to that discussion? Liz. Um, yes, hi. So um, likewise, I completely agree. Um, efficiency is quite important and key. And I suppose the thing I'd like to highlight is um, disadvantaged communities and, and their ability to to potentially like invest in the new technology to, to reduce their bills. I think it's quite important um, when setting these um, um, maybe roadmaps to consider like the society as a whole and, and financial ability to 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 invest in that technology. I might just add, add as well. I mean, I think I think um, the, the role of energy efficiency, just taking taking a leaf from the international book, uh, you know, there's wonderful wedge diagrams of uh, emissions reduction that the uh, the IEA puts out regularly. Energy efficiency seems to have a growing chunk of that, uh, of, that of those wedges as, as we move forward. So I think it's internationally recognised. It's a key 
it's key uh, a key emissions reduction technology indeed very well uh so let's now consider a couple of other questions first of all uh, a bit of a, a question here for sanjiba uh tom asks are the assumptions and data behind the roadmap analysis going to be released publicly thanks ken uh yes um so if I can just take that, I, I understand that question was also asked this morning a couple of times, and it's in relation to the abatement numbers that we used in generating the size of the bubbles in the charts. Now, if this is sounding like a different language to people, I'm just referring to the bubble charts we had in the roadmap itself. Um, so the abatement numbers that we do have, that we calculated, we aren't proposing to release, and it's for, for the following reason, it's a, it's a technical reason. The methodology of how we arrived at those abatement potentials was based on comparison of the low emissions technology with its BAU counterpart, but also assumed a kind of maximum level of deployment for that individual technology. And so um, what I'm saying is the, we assessed it individually for each technology in order to allow us to compare one technology to another in terms of its abatement impact. But um, it does not allow you to simply add up all of the abatement potentials to derive a full uh, abatement thing because what we haven't considered is how what the deployment of one technology impacts others. Now I could give you a hundred examples of the kinds of relationships I'm talking about, but that work, that technical work we haven't done. So the absolute abatement numbers behind the size of the bubbles are not particularly relevant because they're in the, that we've used them just to give you a relative indication of different um, technologies. I hope that's clear. So that the, the numbers around the abatement potentials will not be released. However, um, the numbers around all of the rest of the work, if people are technically, like if they're technically disposed and they want to uh, sort of share their thinking on those numbers, I'm very happy to discuss them with them. But um, yeah, that's on the abatement numbers. Uh, it would simply be confusing if we release the absolute abatement values that we derived. If that needs a follow-up question, if that needs a follow-up response, it's an important point and I just want to be clear about it. So. I'm happy to keep going. Uh, so maybe just uh, to move on to uh, analysis down the track. So a question from Lee, uh, what is the process in place for developing robust impact assessment and who will be involved in developing this process? And will the impact assessment focus on advances to technological innovation or the impacts more broadly? The first thing to say is that uh, the, the roadmap lent very heavily on the work that CSIRO has done on impact evaluation. Um, we talked to a number of people, even globally, I think um, CSIRO's impact evaluation approach is kind of recognized or has been described to me as gold standard. So what we um, are proposing to do is to use the general principles of that impact evaluation framework and lift them up in, in some way. Um, I, I don't want to be too prescriptive at this point because there are some important decisions that we need to take collectively on how that would happen but we really welcome feedback uh, on that. Just to say that it, it will be based, our approach will lean on the CSIRO work and we'll put into full view the impacts that we are wanting to see. So around the stretch goals, around um, uh, you know, those things in the roadmap, those impacts will be what we are measuring um, the success or failure of, of our portfolio against. Also, we won't take over, you know, all of um, you know, the agencies, uh, their, their role in this process, what we would be hoping to do through this is just to set out broad parameters of how we expect that impact evaluation to occur. Good, thank you for that, Sanjeeva. Uh, so uh, there's been a number of, <coughs> pardon me, questions about um, the policy dimension uh, to uh, technology in, uh, in this area. Uh, and I do remember this morning that uh, the chief scientist mentioned uh, how the roadmap and other um, uh, technology based uh, strategies such as the national hydrogen strategy uh, fit together and and how uh, policy then acts as a framework 
uh, superstructure over those particular strategies and roadmaps. Do you want to say something about that, Sanjeev? Because there's a number of questions in that regard. And I think the thing to say about that is that this is a technology investment roadmap. So th this is really the primary task of this particular process is to optimise the government's technology investments, working in partnership with industry and the private sector and things like that. So it really is about the investment, you know, of government funding. We do not, we do not ignore the fact that, of course, there's a whole plethora of policy issues that also heavily impact the deployment of technology. However, there are other processes. So this, this process, uh, for the sake of the task force, I don't think we can take over the whole of the government's program on this stuff. Um, the team's already working pretty hard. Uh, so, but it is a key input. And I think the document that will really bring this all together is the long-term emission reduction strategy that will come out before the next conference of the parties. That document will explain how this, which is a key input, and I think Minister Taylor has described it as a, a very key input into that um, broader picture, how this fits with the, all of the other policy that's happening um, uh, related to low emissions technology, uh, related to policy around low emissions technology. Mm -hmm. Just to name a few, I mean, um, you know, obviously there's uh, also the hydrogen strategy, which is a critical document um, and does go into, you know, the various um, various things that we need to deal with in that, in that sector. Very good. Uh, so uh, we've got a number of uh, very specific technology questions here. So maybe I'll turn to a few of those. Um, so a, a question from Nur Aziz. Uh, for mineral carbonation and carbon dioxide utilisation in the mining industry, uh, what is the biggest hindrance today in the development of that technology? And I guess this is asking the question uh, potentially of Sophia in terms of uh, how this might fit into the roadmap. Thank you. Uh, so mineral carbonation can be applied into a, a range of different industrial scenarios. So we can be taking carbon dioxide from so many different sectors, steel, cement, also from um, cleaning up mining and um, hard to abate um, sectors in the future. So um, really the technology, um, I'm, I'm here representing CO2 Value Australia, but I also work on a um, mineral carbonation international, a technology that transforms CO2 into building materials. Um, over the last seven years, we've enjoyed quite a lot of government support and Australian support, but um, really we've struggled for, um, to gain international recognition for CCU technologies until about one or two years ago. So um, the, the real key has been getting people to um, acknowledge that there's a really high potential for scalability, that it's an investable option to turn CO2 into ma building materials and other, um, other fuels and, and things. And so um, because CCS has been, um, has taken up a lot of um, airtime with regard to carbon, um, carbon um, technologies, we found it um, that until two years ago, we had a little bit of trouble getting um, airtime. But now um, the technology is passed a certain um, readiness level, which the, um, the roadmap was really good at setting out. And now the key is going to be continuing that momentum and also helping other companies to um, also progress up that technology readiness level in acknowledgement that the potential is so high even though um, they might need a bit more support in that um, valley of death that Elizabeth was also talking about, um, helping those technologies get through that really hard first um, 10 years um, could result in so much potential, um, cleaning up a lot of industries that we'll be needing far into the future towards 2050. Thanks, Sophia. Um, and actually that raises a question raised by another participant. Um, and again, this is maybe something for Sanjeeva. So, Sophia mentioned the Valley of Death. So investment to help uh, technologies move through the Valley of Death uh, can be considered, uh, you know, a, a bit of a, a, um, a, 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 a big leveraging opportunity because, you know, once you get through the Valley of Death and you can start to move out the other side, then things can start to grow and take off. Um, 
Somebody's asked a question about uh, mature technologies, uh, and and so that's where this is relevant. Um, where you know a lot of the investment in the R and D has actually happened already. So uh, is, is there a sort of tension between uh, investment in uh, in new technologies that might be kicked along and reach the market earlier, uh, an important factor in in considering where to invest versus very mature technologies, uh, which uh, have already, you know, flattened the, um, the, the cost curve, uh, uh, but uh, are on the other hand, uh, looking for scale. So a number of uh, questions are along these lines. So we might maybe have a little bit of a discussion around that and not just uh, Sanjeeva necessarily, but others as well. Well, it's where the, um, the multi layers of timeframes are really helpful. So, um, the document talks about the next two years, the following three, and the uh, and the remainder of the decade. And um, I know there's a goal that uh, the whole thing be simplified, and you know, ideally you could count on one hand what the nation's priorities are, but um, the portfolio approach is ultimately what will be needed. So, in the the document's quite clear that in the short term there is a there are, there are a large bucket of technologies for whom deployment is the challenge. And that the investment there, I, 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 um, I, I would surmise, is likely to be investment that's directed at the pool part, and, and that is purchase commitments, for example, or investment in business model um, uh, updating, for example, to, so that the deployment of those technologies occurs. Um, where the portfolio approach comes in is technologies that still need to be pushed along the early stage part in order to have their emissions benefit in the latter half of the decade, will obviously be part of that impact framework that Sanjeeva was talking about, and which is why it's going to need to be multi-layered. Um, but I think the document allows for those different time scales. And so those mature technologies earn their emissions reduction points, if you like, at the early times. So they'll, they'll get points in that category for, for being, being ready to abate immediately but they're not being deployed in a business as usual scenario. So that's where the funding can help, um, uh, you know, uh, catalyze that deployment, whether it's a bit of cost reduction, sweetener, or, uh, or combined with policy. Um, similarly, at the other end where it's early stage, but you know there's a large abatement uh, potential. So one example we haven't talked much about at the moment is the agriculture sector, but our research from decarbonisation futures shows that the potential, for example, for substitution of some of the livestock feed, um, whether it's vaccines for the livestock or whether it's the combination of their feed that reduces their methane production um, while maintaining their agricultural production. We showed that in two different scenarios, agricultural emissions could halve if that technology deployment goes well. And it might mean we need to use drones to do it widespread. It might mean that we need, we need to think about what's the business model for adjusting the feed at scale. But there was a 40 megaton saving between one scenario and another nationwide within a decade. So there are some very um, high impact technological bets that you'd want to place a bet on and that, that, that need some still some, uh, some push through in that earlier stage. So it, when, when you get to the detail, I think thinking about it in the time categories and thinking about that difference between mature and emerging um, makes it qu quite easy, and certainly, in, I say quite easy, in our research, we categorised which technologies needed support in deployment because they're already mature and which, which of them were emerging and needed a bit more of the pull through. And I think you could have a, a matrix result in that impact assessment that Sanjeeva was talking about that would allow uh, the government investment to be tailored for those different needs. Uh, Anna and uh, others, you know, know a lot more than me about these th these particular issues. So I would totally defer to her. Um, uh, and and uh, just to support what she's saying there, uh, one interesting thing. I mean, one of the best parts of my job at the moment is that a lot of great people uh, pick up the phone when I call, and they're explaining their thoughts on these different ideas. And one of the professors in the States that I was, uh, I was put in touch with, I, I think from people in your team, um, uh, Ken, uh, so just to confirm, I mean, what I'm saying here is uh, just my own early thinking about certain, how do we approach these particular issues? Um, and, and also actually one of the panel members who, who's, 
who's really said to us, you know, the challenge is going to be getting a laser-like focus to the government's investment. And um, when we talk of the valley of death, I think we often talk about that as being the one that gets you from, uh, you know, gets you from sort of small scale demonstration out to larger scale demonstration and commercialization. But this professional in the States who has done an in-depth study of uh, the US innovation system says there's actually these three valleys of death. And one occurs when, you know, the university researcher or whoever has uh, come up with their idea, but to get it to the first prototype stage, that when you can see a prototype, it's much more likely that an investor is going to, you know, see the wheels turning on it and, and, and want to invest. Um, you know, so he's identified these three different points. But one of the big challenges and the one that I hope Anna and others will make written submissions that we can kind of digest quietly is how do we bring that laser-like focus to the government's investment? The minister's very clear. We don't want to be stepping on the toes of the private sector. We don't want to be you know, crowding out private investment um, unwittingly. What we want to do is to really understand we have a small, you know, we have a relatively small amount. Um, if you look at the total investment required to pull these technologies through, it's, a, it's going to be a relatively small thing, amount of money that we'll be able to need to get up the greatest bang for buck. And, you know, that's the way we need to approach spending public money. So, um, you know, where are those specific points in the innovation chain that we, we need to see the government's investment? And do they vary from technology to technology? I mean, it's a very complex, complex question. Yeah, and I think it was uh, reflected by uh, quite a few participants here as being a, a key uh, question that needs to be looked at uh, over time. Um, so speaking of time, we're at the end of our, our allocated time. Uh, I'd like to just go quickly around the panel, uh, Sanjeeva excluded, uh, to ask them about, uh, in, in a, a few seconds, what they think should be a stretch goal uh, in the roadmap, if they have one. Um, I might start with Patrick, because we've already heard about the $2 uh, a kilo hydrogen stretch goal. Patrick, what do you think about that? And uh, what do you think about an ammonia stretch goal that uh, is uh, similarly uh, uh, placed? Oh, that's, uh, you caught me you caught me off guard there, Ken. I was going to say my work is done. Yeah, the H2 under two goal is quite uh, uh, makes a lot of sense from our perspective, I think, and uh, based on the analysis we've we, analysis we've done. Uh, ammonia, another story. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what that price would be, and, it, and clearly with things like ammonia, you start to ask the question: Is it about production or is it about at uh, at uh, use in, in, in potentially in foreign countries? FOB. Uh, so maybe an FOB an FOB price for ammonia might be. Uh, uh, might be something we should look at, but I can't give you a straight number on that. <laughs> Don't want a dollar out of you quite yet, but uh, yeah, thank you, Patrick. Uh, Sophia? We absolutely would like to see a CCU or a CCSUS stretch goal. Um, this morning, Alan Finkel mentioned that he thought um, a CCS stretch goal could be something like X dollars per tonne of CO2 costs of storage. That doesn't really work in the CCU space. So I think we need to be um, getting some independent government validation for amount of CO2 um, abated and um, the industry development potential. So a little bit more work needs to be done in this space. Thank you, Svea. Uh, Frank. Uh, please also think about interim targets. So if it's a roadmap, that's usually something that shows you the way, not just the destination. Um, and, you know, when we think about goals, then uh, quantity goals make sense as well. Look to other countries, uh, Germany, for example, in the material that's coming out there today, hydrogen strategy, uh, compact with the steel industry. There's a stretch goal there of providing five uh, mega, five gigawatt um, equivalents electrolyzer capacity just to the German steel industry. Think of those kind of stretch goals. So for me, um... When I think about stretch goals, I'd like to see um, renewables essentially generating energy for free. And, and then, you know, how do we think about what a, being a good citizen is? So, you know, how do we um, limit our expansion of the infrastructure and things like that? So I think a stretch goal, you know, targeting a really cost dollar per kilowatt hour. So like, to, let's say two cents per kilowatt hour um, for electricity um, essentially takes the, the kilowatt hour off the, off the the table um, because it becomes so cheap and, and makes us think more deeply about how do we control and coordinate and make this sort of grid work. And finally, Anna. I'm going to hedge by saying each sector needs its stretch goals. 
So uh, if buildings, for example, I'd focus on demand management because you've got the electrification happening in the other sector and thinking about zero emissions homes, zero emissions buildings, and the stretch goal being the percentage reached within the half decade and the decade. Um, because we already acknowledge there's, uh, it's cost is not the issue as much as it is the way it's funded, uh, financed. Um, but I'd also want to support the stretch goals that Frank mentioned for industry. Um, and there are so many more industry subsectors where we could have some really powerful stretch goals around material substitution and use um, across, we've mentioned steel, hydrogen, aluminium, cement, for example. Uh, and then transport, the same. Uh, an, an electrification stretch goal for transport uh, of, of passenger, not just cars, but also buses and trucks. So we've, we've had very little discussion about freight, uh, but I want to mention um, electrification of, of trucks. We also um, show that that needs to reach about two thirds of, of new trucks in a decade being electric. And aviation, Australia, an island continent, has a competitive advantage, but also need uh, to be able to have zero emissions transport in the future. And, um, and we have an airline sector um, right now seeking support from government. So looking at uh, clean aviation fuels, both electric for short haul, I know there are commercial investors already doing venture capital for that, and uh, biofuels for long haul. Um, uh, we should be investing hard there. It, that's a need that's never gonna go away. Well, uh, I think uh, that uh, is a good point at which to, to finish, uh, thinking about a stretch goal uh, looking well into the future, but as Frank mentions, also in the, in the, in the near term as well. Um, we uh, are at a point now where we haven't obviously answered every question uh, put forward, but uh, I've uh, tried at least to group them and, and answer as many as we can in, in, uh, in bundles. Uh, thank you to our audience. Uh, we still have lots of questions to go. Um, maybe we can uh, help by uh, answering some of them uh, offline. Uh, we um, had a, a terrific turnout today, uh, well over 200 people. We still got a, a, a more than half of them with us. Uh, and, uh, and it's been a terrific discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists, Sophia Hamlin Wang, Patrick Hartley, Liz Ratnam, Anna Scarbeck, Frank Yotso, and particularly Sanjeeva De Silva for walking into the lion's den with us today. Uh, and uh, we um, hope to, uh, to hear more about this uh, in, uh, in coming weeks and indeed encourage uh, everyone who participated to have a good uh, look at the discussion paper and provide your input into the response process. So thank you all once again. Uh, the ANU Energy Change Institute will uh, uh, be having more uh, webinars like this during the COVID-19 uh, situation uh, and we look forward to hosting you again on another occasion. Thank you all very much.